Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Good morning. Good morning, my church family. Well, I am Pastor Michael. I am the Celebrate Recovery Pastor here at Family Church. It is always just an, a privilege and a pleasure to be sharing with you here uh, this morning. So as we close out this month of July and, and this sermon series we entitled Celebrate Life. You know, we've been talking a lot about Celebrate Recovery and the many issues of life that we all experience with no exceptions. Y'all getting tired of us telling you how many issues y'all have yet? Good, good. I, I feel your pain and your discomfort with this topic of issues. You know, when, when the pain that, you know, my life led me to, you know, when, I, when that pain finally outweighed my fear, that pain finally outweighed my pride, you know, it was time to set that pride aside you know, and really step out of denial and stop telling myself, you know, I got this, nothing's wrong. You know, I had to look myself in the mirror, you know, and just admit that I am one of those people. And I get it, that's, that's not easy for any of us. You know, but the truth is, you know, as we have been lovingly reminding you all, all month, we are all one of those people. All of us. Without exception, you know, Romans 3.23 makes this very clear. It says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, when Paul was writing this letter to the, to the Christian churches in Rome, you know, he was really differentiating between, you know, the Jewish people and what they called the Gentiles. But really what he meant was the Jewish people and everybody else. That means all, all have fallen short of the glory of God. You know, there is no big sin and little sin. Sin is sin. Can we all agree on that? Sin is sin. It is all the same in God's eyes. You know, and it all goes back to the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden. You know, and I want y'all to know that your sin does not disqualify you from serving God. Amen. Your mistakes do not disqualify you from serving the kingdom. I want you to believe that today. So I, don't, I want to take a look at where it began when sin entered the world and why you can stop being so hard on yourself about your past mistakes. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus, thank you, for, thank you for this day and this time together with my church family. Lord, I pray for peace today, God. I pray this message brings comfort to anyone struggling and that they can rest in that comfort knowing our mistakes are not a waste, that you can use our mistakes and our failures for good when we confess them to you and to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So God's word tells us he does not remember our sin. It says it in a couple different spots. But we certainly don't have any problem remembering our sin, do we? The sins of others, our own sin. There is no spiritual amnesia there, is there? You know, that's because we all have memory. You know, we all have this little hard drive piece of our brain where we store all the events that transpire over the course of our lives. You know, and we are designed by God that way. You know, when God breathed life into Adam, intelligence came with it. You know, we were given the ability to reason. You know, we were given the ability to determine right from wrong and the ability to recall to remember. And everybody wants to remember the good times, right? The happy memories. 
It's those unpleasant parts of life that we would prefer to forget. You know, the embarrassments, you know, the poor choices that we've made, um, the abuse suffered at the hands of others. But we all have to be very careful that those attempts don't fall into this pattern of denial. You know, you can't just take unpleasant memories and try to stuff them away down in that vault we all have, lock the key, and forget about it. It doesn't work. You know, um, that never works. I know I tried for decades. Denial is never a healthy way to deal with your mistakes. You know, I have many unpleasant you know, even tragic events that have transpired over the course of my life and trying to forget them, you know, stuffing them away and falling into that pattern of denial only led to more unpleasantness and more mistakes. I had to come to peace with my past, confront it, right, confront it, forehead to forehead and learn from it. You know, and I shared this with you last week, mistakes are mistakes, but the second time, it's a choice. So the scripture I want to look at this week takes us back. It takes us way back. You know, it is in the story of creation, and we, we, we see where, where our sin began. So let's go back there. And it's in the garden, right? That perfect, angelic place. The flowers are always blooming. The sun's always shining. The birds are chirping. You know, it never rained on the day Adam and Eve wanted to have a barbecue. Everything was just right. But I want to look at this verse, and then I want to kind of digress back from here a little bit. In Genesis 3, chapter, uh, verses 8 through 10, it said, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And Adam answered. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. You know, I think most people are familiar with this, this event um, from the Bible. You know, God creates the heavens and the earth. You know, the land and the seas, all the animals, the birds and the fish. And let's back up a little bit. Then he makes a man and he puts him in the garden. In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of eating to work it and to keep it. So God places Adam in the garden and tells him to work it and take care of it. He gives Adam a purpose. He gives him a reason to get up every morning, right? He gives him a job. Immediately after this, though, God gives Adam his second instruction. And this one takes the form of a command. Very next verse, 16, said, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Sounds like a pretty warning of a command, doesn't it? So I want to continue kind of on this topic we, we looked at last week where, where the message was about our past hurts, your future fears, and why it is important to stay in the present because change always happens in the present. So let's back up even a little further, right? We're in the garden, it's perfect, everything's going right, and here's where it starts to go south. Chapter 2, verse 1. The serpent addresses Eve. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did he really say it like that? He's talking to Eve, but I want to look at Adam and how he handled his mistake. Right, he hears God walking around in the garden, and he hides from him. And Adam and Eve were together the whole time. 
I'll show you where. Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, she was probably a little hungry, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, who was with her, and he ate it too. So that's the verse. That's the verse what has been called the fall of mankind. You know, and when Eve is deceived by this serpent, the enemy, and eats from the tree in the middle of the garden, Adam was right there and did absolutely nothing to prevent it. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but if me and my wife were the only two people in the Garden of Eden, and all of a sudden I see her having a conversation with somebody, that's red flag number one, folks. I'm, I want to go find out what's being said, right? That's my woman. <laughs> and it's a talking snake. <laughs> red flag number two. Like, you know, I can't say exactly what Adam was doing in this moment, but I like, dude, do something. Say something. He was the one who received the command from God. We just looked at that, right, in, in verse 16. So then after they eat the fruit, when they hear God strolling around, he feels fear for the very first time in his life. And he has this sudden understanding that evil exists. All brand new to Adam. So I want to point out a, a few things about all this. After Adam sinned, he said, I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. He ran from the, really the only person that can fix it, God. How many times have you heard this? Well, I can't go to church. The building will fall down or get hit by lightning. You know, as if. But we do it all the time. We run from God. So my first point I want to make about Adam is Adam's core emotion was fear. Fear. Real fear for the very first time in his life. You know, Adam's vulnerability was, was far more than just modesty. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm naked. It, it was far more than that. Something deep in his soul was exposed for the very first time. You know, and fear is one of our most powerful emotions, right? It, it can drive people to extremes. And in general, we work pretty hard to avoid it, don't we? You know, I mean, sure, you know, we'll go to a scary movie or, um, you know, we'll jump on a roller coaster at Six Flags to get that adrenaline flowing, but only because we know it's safe, right? Only because you're 99.9% you're .9 sure everything's going to work out in, in the end. I mean, let me ask you this. If you were to go skydiving, right, you're on a plane at 13,000 feet, and the instructor all of a sudden comes up to you and said, well, look, there's only a 50-50 chance that the parachute's actually going to open and everything's going to work out okay. Would you go? No. No. Right, put this thing on the ground and let me step off of it, please. Uh, uh, thank you. You know, so most fear is unpleasant. And God designed it that way into us. You know, one of a human being's basic core instincts is self-preservation. You feel fire, you feel heat, you pull away. You know, even as babies, you know, babies don't have to be taught to cry out, do they? You know, if it's hot, they cry out. If they're cold, they cry out. They crap their pants, they cry out. They don't have to be taught that. It's just built into us because it's the only thing they know how to do to try to make things right again. So when we get scared, you know, we become hesitant, become very cautious, very carefully choosing our next step. So fear has a purpose, a godly purpose. You know, it is to be used as a warning sign to be careful and to be cautious because there may be something dangerous around the corner. Fear is not, however, designed to us to live in constant fear that is driven by our own imagination 
constantly worrying about what we think might happen, right? Stories we tell ourselves. You know, in those cases, God tells us what to do. So we looked at this last week in Jeremiah 1a. It says, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. So use your fear the way God intended it. Um, you know, if you don't, your fear is using you. Your fear is the one in control, not you. So my second point about our buddy Adam is this. Adam's core motivation was shame. His core emotion was fear, but his co core motivation was shame. You know, in the moment of the fall, innocence was lost. And something very deep was just exposed. You know, Adam and Eve had the realization that something was wrong deep in their core. And it was driven by fear and shame. Fear of awareness. All of a sudden, I understand I'm naked. The shame of being unacceptable. The fear of rejection. You know, and I think we all do this or have done this. You know, have you ever not tried something new because of a fear of failure? Have you ever not tried something new because you did not want to be exposed to shame or embarrassment or possibly humiliation? I think we all have. You know, listen, there was a time you would not have caught me standing here on a Sunday morning under any circumstance on this platform because of my own fears. You know, I would have said, well, what if they don't like my message? What if my laptop fails and my sermon notes disappear in the middle of my message? <laughs> Happens more often than you might think. What if I say something stupid? like I did last week. You know, I was watching um, my sermon, and, you know, because of my own self-esteem issues, I really don't like to watch myself on video. It makes me uncomfortable, but I forced myself to watch it because, you know, I wanted to, you know, make it better. I want to see, you know, did I have any nervous twitches or, you know, anything, and, you know, what, what were my hands doing? So I really wanted to watch it so I could improve. So I'm watching it, and I hear the word copanism come out of my mouth. So what? I rewound it, and sure enough, copanism. So what is a copanism? So I, got, I was trying to talk about coping mechanisms, and the word copanism came out of my mouth. So mistakes will happen, folks. Mistakes will happen. Um, you know, hey, and maybe I invented a new word, right? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it'll catch on someday. I'll tell you this, if I see Joel Osteen using it in one of his sermons, <laughs> he's going to get a letter from me. And that letter is going to say, thank you, sir. Thank you for honoring me by using yet another one of my mistakes to advance the kingdom of God. <laughs> You know, and, and that's what recovery is all about, really. You know, if we don't talk about and share about our mistakes and our past pain, then mistakes are wasted and your pain's only purpose was to hurt you. So I try to promptly admit my mistakes, you know, regardless of what it makes people think of me. You know, I learned a few years back that, you know, what people think about me is really none of my business. You know, as, yeah, really, as long as I put in the work and the preparation, I have, I spend my prayer time and my alone time with God, another person's negative response is really their issue and not mine. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know. 
I, I realize that every single per person that I ever meet in my life is not going to like me. But I know. I know, right? I don't get it either, but... I mean, once you get to know me, I'm like a basket full of puppies, folks. I mean, come on. But let's get back to Adam. Fear and shame. Adam's core emotion and Adam's core motivation. But how did Adam handle this in the moment? You know, I always often wonder, was this like a snap decision? Um, you know, was, did they eat the fruit in the morning, you know, because they were hungry, it was breakfast, you know, said God was walking around in the cool of the day, you know, probably later toward the evening. Did they like spend the whole day fretting about this like, OMG, you're naked, I'm naked. What is daddy going to think? Eve, get two fig leaves and cover those things up. <laughs> get three fig leaves, maybe four. Adam, where are you? Oh my God, there he is, hide. Right? We run. This had to be the worst day of Adam and Eve's life to this point. Truly just a horrifying and terrible day. So Adam's core strategy is what? Adam's core strategy or copanism was to hide. The fig leaves they used were to cover themselves were just completely inadequate. You know, and people seek many strategies in life to keep, keep in shame and hiding, um, you know, to cover, you know, we use money, we use fame, um, we use addictions, even religion to cover our own fear and our own shame. And the enemy... Enemy uses many strategies to keep people in shame and hiding. You know, but when he deals with us, you know, as believers, his only real strategy is deception. That's all he's really got left. You know, because, you know, we are covered by the blood that Jesus shed on that cross. He can't touch us. The Bible says the enemy will flee at the name of Jesus. He is a defeated foe. But he won't give up. He will not give up. The Bible also calls him the God of this world. You know, he is still there in the background of our lives, whispering lies, you know, throwing out deceiving thoughts and ideas that he hopes will believe. Deception, that's all he has. Now, I don't like to give the enemy too much credit for all the bad um, we see in the world. I really don't like to give him any credit at all. But sometimes it is just the dumb ideas and stupid actions of, well, us. But the Bible clearly states in 1 Peter 5.8, says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And it says, like a roaring lion, not is a roaring lion. You know, there is only one roaring lion. That's the Lion of Judah, and his name is Jesus Christ. You know, so I, I hope you all received this today and, and got something out of these last five weeks as we um, did this Celebrate Life series. You know, one of the goals for us here at, at Family Church is really to remove the stigmas that society has placed on people struggling with addictions, people struggling with mental health issues. People struggling with the hurts and hang-ups in our lives. And I want you to know it is okay to ask for help. Right. It's okay to seek help. 
You know, if you have something going on in your life that is producing fear and anxiety for you, uh, I want you to know that your fear is real. If it's real to you, it's real. But you do not have to live in fear. You know, you are not alone. At least you don't have to be. Um, as a Celebrate Recovery pastor here, you know, I, I get to sit every week in a circle with a group of men who are just the rawest and most honest group of guys I have ever met in my life. You know, we, we don't cover up anything in fig, with fig leaves in that circle. And we're not sitting around, you know, it's not weird or anything, so... We do have clothes on. <laughs> you know, I, but I've, I'll tell you, I spent 30 years in healthcare. I've sat in corporation boardrooms with some pretty powerful people. You know, I've sat in a couple courtrooms, uh, not at the good table, um, with some powerful people. And I have not seen a fraction of the integrity that I get to witness every week in that, in that circle. You know, so with honesty and integrity comes peace. With confession and prayer comes healing. James 5.16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Spending time with other believers making connections with other people, praying together is the best way to learn how to live with your past mistakes and, and use your fears for the godly purpose he intended. You know, James 5.16 goes on to say, the prayers of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So if you think you are powerless over your fears, over your guilt and over your shame, because you are. That power can only come from prayer and a relationship with a loving God who loves you right now just the way you are. Right in this moment. I don't care what you did yesterday or the day before or 10 years ago. God loves you right now. So, so if you've never had the opportunity to come into that loving relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. We want to offer that to you right now. You know, and I don't want to make this uncomfortable for anybody. I'm not going to ask anybody to stand or come up front here at Family Church. We do this simply by praying a prayer together out loud. And it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. Jesus, I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life, into my heart, to change me and make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you put a comment in the comment section? One of our online hosts or online pastors would love to follow up with you and get some information into your hands that will help you along the way on your uh, next steps with your walk with God. If you are in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, again, I'm not going to try to embarrass anybody, but would you do us the honor of being a witness to a life going from darkness to light. Just give me a quick wave if you prayed that prayer for the first time. Anybody at all? We got one. I see you. I see you. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we, we love seeing that, that, that life transformed, and that's what we get to watch at Celebrate Recovery. Lives, 
even in the saved lives, going from messed up to a little more healthier each and every week. So we meet every week at 7 p.m. Thursday night. We'd love to see you there. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.